All right, um, 93 Explorer. This is the problem I'm currently having. This is me having to force it to idle. I'm not quite sure what's going on. There's no check engine light and <laughs> It's doing this weirdness. Yeah, I'm not. So, this is two days after. And now I'm going to start work on the old girl. So, um, a few more things have been discovered. I've been reading on Explore Forum, Ranger Station, you know, looking at a bunch of different stuff. Um, so, what I'm being kind of told is this. It runs without the math connected. So I think maybe my mass airflow sensor might be going out. Hmm. Which is the original one that this truck came with in 1993. But the mechanic over at uh, the shop told me that this is all kind of ripped and got a few leaky spots. So we'll take a look at the intake manifold. Uh, thing. Um, another thing probably to check would be my IAC, uh, idle air controller, which is right over here. That's something that I've been looking up on my own. <laughs> um, what I'm probably going to do today is I'm going to test my math, um, get some cleaner for it, clean it, um, see if that makes an improvement. If that doesn't, do the IAC. Um, and another thing we might do, since this is a 93 Explorer, and I have not seen anyone on YouTube point where this is. Oh wait, that's an anti-lock test. So, if you look around over here somewhere, there's supposed to be an OBD-1. There it is. It's my OBD-1 test port right over here, right above the fuse box, master fuse box under the hood. So... Right now, I'm gonna try to kind of capture what she's running like, cause now it's running like that, but I have the MAF disconnected. If it's running like that with the MAF disconnected, but it won't start with it connected, I have a feeling the mass airflow sensor might be faulty. Just something I'm thinking about. But anyway, let's go take a second look at my symptoms. So if we get in here, let's see. I'm having to hold down the gas to keep throttle. I find it kind of surprising she's able to idle so low. And as you can see, it just dies if you don't give her gas. So. That's what we're dealing with, and it smells a bit like gas, which tells me this is actually running rich, even though um, they said the OBD1 codes are lean codes, but <laughs> that could be the case. Anyway, I'm gonna pull off the map and uh, go take a look. So here's uh, what you need to actually take this uh, mass airflow sensor out. You got, uh, let's see what the numbers are on it. It's a Torx T20 security bit. So it's a Torx bit that has a hole in the middle. And that hole goes into here. And these guys here. So. So I gotta put it in here on my ratchet driver here and hope I don't drop it. Cause I'm doing all this one handed while on camera. But we're gonna take that out and have a look. So now I have the mass airflow sensor out, and this is what a 1993 Ford Explorer, or this also applies to Rangers, Aero Stars, anything with the uh, Cologne 4 liter V6. If you look over here, I'm gonna try to bring it up in the light, but if you look, you can see there are two filaments on there one of the filaments looks either dirty or burned. 
So I'm probably gonna go pick up some proper math cleaner for this. I was gonna be here. So that's probably what we're gonna do. We're gonna clean the math. I'm gonna inspect this because uh, the guy at the shop told me that this was torn. He's having trouble getting it on there. I'm not 100% sure that that would be the cause of the problem considering I don't even know how long it's probably been that messed up. So, but I'm gonna put this back on. Um, maybe formulate some more plans and then we'll clean this, see if it makes an improvement or allows it to run with it on. Um, the next thing that we'll look at up over here will be our uh, idle air controller, which is attached to the air intake plenum on the uh, engine. Just to know where I'm coming from, so when I talked to the guys at the shop, they said it was throwing codes that said it was running lean. This does not seem like a lean condition. I've I've messed with carburetors before. I've worked on lawn mowers. Um, typically, it could be throwing false lean codes because it's getting too much air through here, and possibly also due to that burned filament on the MAF. And if the filament is too damaged, I might have to replace this. But that won't be a problem. I'll just take this sucker over to the shop over to uh, pick and pull and we could probably just go pull working one for a while off of another old explorer something else i need to address in my line of ford explorer restoration related projects is the air fill air box does have this one hole over here where no bolt goes in and nothing attaches and this screw won't stay because there's no clasp here. So that might be what I'm going to do is go to a scrap yard at some point. Oh, there it is. So there's this screw here. I'm probably gonna go to the scrap yard at some point and probably take a look at all this stuff. I'm also gonna go see if maybe I have some leaking coming in through the air box because it might be just a little too much for this poor thing. Right now we're gonna take this off first. Um, the intake tube right here, of course, is the original one from 1993, because pretty much everything on this darn truck is blessed and somehow manages to last way longer than it's supposed to. <laughs> so, eh, we'll just take this guy off and take a look and find out how much more doomsday we have to deal with, even though this... Might also take a look in the throttle body there to see how dirty or clean it is. So now we've got the intake tube off. I was told that this is cracked somewhere or burned. This looks pretty normal. Um, I don't really see any cracked or burned spots on here, really. I mean, the gaskets even seem surprisingly still rubbery. This one is all jacked up, but we can take care of that pick and pull. And then we have that little problem in there. So yeah, this gasket's probably got to go. This gasket's all right. Okay, so um, I'm doing some more looking. It looks like my intake might need cleaned. Um, we're going to try to kind of take care of that. Maybe I'll make a new gasket for this. I'm also going to try to clean that burn spot off the uh, mass airflow sensor. I don't know if I can make it more visible. Yeah, because if you look right there on the topmost, let me scoot it back. If you look right there on the side, topmost filament, you can see some dirt. So that's what the game plan is right now. And I'm cleaning that. I said just for kicks to clean the throttle body. A little bit it's looking pretty clean I'm gonna probably go in there and do a more detailed job because I'm kind of nitpicky and I really want to make sure all this uh, airflow path is clean I'm also gonna do that to this but since this comes before the math sensor I'm gonna use math cleaner to do it because then it won't leave that residue and that screws up your math sensor can screw up the computer could be even this is the only thing, but I'm gonna do the IAC while I'm at it, I decided. The idle air controller. I mean, looking inside, I can't tell how dirty it is. I can't even see inside. That's the weird thing. 
if you look up in there, it's pretty nasty, I think. So I'm gonna clean it out and we'll see what it's like. I'm gonna use this intake valve and turbo cleaner for, for it for right now. And then we'll maybe clean it a second time. Cause I wanna get all the residue off of everything and get this thing nice and clean. We're working on her still. Um, I just cleaned my uh, intake tube out, which is dirty. You know, the throttle body's all neat and clean now. Um, worked on this intake for the MAF sensor. Might replace that gasket there. Since it's cardboard, I could probably fabricate a new replacement. Uh, the MAF sensor might be bad. Uh, you can see a burn mark is there. I've been using this on it all morning and it hasn't really cleaned up very well. Um, found this gasket's trashed, so I'm probably going to have to replace that. Um, cleaned up the idle air sensor. So I cleaned up the idle air control and it was really messy. Let me see if we can bring it out into the light. Yeah. I don't think I showed, but it was really messy. I mean, tons of black stuff coming out of here. So it might have been my IAC too. So I'm going to let all this dry and clean up. And then I'm going to do a few electrical tests since I've disconnected my battery. And I'm going to let the computer reset itself. And then we'll put all this back together, even with the trash gasket, and see if she fires. She's running a little bit better, and that means I can start perfecting the two things here, which is mainly the throttle body gasket and the uh, screw anchor for my air box. Okay, now we've put her all back together. The IAC is all cleaned up. Looks almost brand new now. <laughs> my jacked gasket, which is only there just for temporary testing. Oh yeah, this is the preliminary checks before um, we try and start her. So. Put on the tube right here. We have these lines going down. Over here, that's all clean. Math's clean, math's plugged in, computer reset. And if anything's wonky, then we pull the OBD1 codes. So, time for the moment of truth. Okay, so she's still doing it, but it seems a little bit improved. So, I'm willing to bet it's that mass airflow sensor. It just seems like that might be the issue. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go see about getting a MAF at the junkyard. Uh, maybe an IAC and a few other things, but we've cleaned it all up, so I may see if she starts real quick and then we'll take a look at the engine bay, see if I can find any vacuum leaks just in case that's the case. Well, she's starting without me having to crank it much anymore. That's actually a little bit better. As you can see, no check engine light. So I think we're gonna pull the OBD codes. So before we pull any vacuum leak codes, we're gonna go ahead and go look over here behind the air box. So we're gonna pull the OBD codes, and this is the connector over here um, that you use. You can detach it from the air box too. That's what a lot of people do. Mine's still there because I don't even think mine's even had the codes pulled. I'll get this off, and then we'll talk.
So I got my OBD plug-in all the wrong. So here's how you do the uh, OBD2 test codes. And then I've fixed my light and taken the whole dash apart. So as you can see right here, we have this gray terminal here that is inside the cover for the OBD reader. So actually, let's see this. So inside your cover for your OBD reader, there's the main, uh, there's like the DLC connector and then there's the STI connector. The gray one's the STI, the DLC is the black one. On the DLC, you're gonna want the red cable going from the right pin on the top two over to the STI. And then on the second from the right, on the bottom row, you go to your test lamp and then your test lamp goes to the negative terminal on the battery cable. Okay, here we go. So I corrected it. Here we go. So now we're gonna do the key, key off, engine off codes. Seven, one, two, Okay, so it looks like it's repeating codes now. Just gonna turn the engine off. And then we're gonna try to pull key K-O-E-R codes, which are key on in or key on engine running. And we're gonna see what codes we get from OBD1 with that. So with that, I'm gonna put the truck in neutral and we're gonna go ahead and start. Whoa, there she goes. So I'm not gonna do that too much longer because when I checked earlier, so I do know for a fact, based upon the evidence I found under the hood when I pulled the oil dipstick out and sniffed it myself, it smelled like gasoline. That sounds like something, 
something isn't managing the air properly. It could be the IAC. It could be the um, could be the it could be the uh, IAC. It could be the uh, MAF, which I think is the MAF because it's burned. I took a look at it, and one of the elements it looks burned on one side. Um, I know it's technically throwing parts at it, but you know. I'm going to go to the junkyard. I'm going to get a cheap MAF that looks like it's good and has clean filaments. And then we're going to throw it in here and see if there's any improvement. Um, I'm seriously tempted to pick up another IAC if I manage to find one that actually looks nice. But we'll see on that. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I'll update later. And we're back from the shop. We're up picking pool. show my first theory and the first thing we're going to test here but I'm also going to fix all the crap that um uh Jack Toon and Washington did to my truck they lost the bolt of course for my airbox and well that's a little press fit affair kind of like uh Fender Telecaster string funeral you know like the little holes in the back of the guitar the strings go through the threaded so it's just press fit we've got the there. Over here, I found a practically brand spanking new IAC from a Ranger. This is in case my IAC is bad. And that I'll test that theory later if the uh, MAF sensor doesn't work. But I wanted to focus on the MAF sensor. If we look here, really close on this one, and I don't know if I can focus it enough, um, we can kind of see that the filament on it is burned. This is the MAF I pulled from a 1994 Ford Explorer, um, and it's got, it looks to be in pretty nice shape. I'm gonna still run MAF cleaner over it, just in case there's any residue or any other stuff that the previous person did. It was kind of expensive, but eh, whatever. Oh yeah, and I got my uh, throttle body cover that the morons at uh, the shop in Washington left off my truck. Um, place that uh, has the initials PT. Um, so, yeah, replacing missing parts and testing and making sure stuff works. You know what would be great? If this ends up being the solution, because then it's just like one simple part. And it would make sense because the filament on this, if you look at it, it looks pretty burnt. So now I've done all the stuff. I've got, finally got my air box screwed in nice and tight. Got my throttle body cover back on here, so now she looks factory again. And my mass airflow sensor, the new one. Put in, all cleaned up. Um, we're gonna disconnect. We're gonna probably, um, since it's a pretty fresh start and it hasn't learned how to idle yet, I'm gonna go ahead and just try her and see how she does. Put my tools down here. Right. And we're gonna start her. See how she does. It's running a little better now. Okay, so of course it's about day four of this fiasco. Uh, this morning I went in the fuse box and tried what a guy on Explorer and Forum said to do, which is basically switch out the uh, ABS relay for the ECM relay, and I saw actually a little bit of improvement. Also, I think probably the engine learning some of its settings from this stuff it really helps too, since this was just dirty as heck when we cleaned it. I mean, I didn't even video, it was embarrassing. And this was burned or at least the old one was burned. So, yeah, so we might be on our way to recovery today. Um, I'm gonna disconnect the battery here and pull the uh, EEC4 uh, engine control module from under there. So I named this uh, video, it's gonna be called uh, Where Cars and Computers Collide, <clears throat> because 
when I went through my when I went through my codes for from the uh, OBD one yesterday, basically one of them was a 513 telling me that there's an internal voltage fault on the EEC, and it was also telling me that uh, my throttle position sensor wasn't getting her enough voltage, and neither was the neither was uh, in some cases the cooling sensor, and somewhere over here, I think it's right there, is your IAT or idle idle air temperature sensor. So I'm gonna probably look at these. I mean, looking at all my stuff under the hood, I mean, my wiring is like in nice shape for almost 30 years old. There's not a single splayed or, I mean, I'm even shocked. Even these rubber hoses in here. Yeah, it's my purge canister. So <clears throat> even these hoses in here are actually still very flexible. And that's kind of weird considering this thing has hoses that are almost 30 years old. Um, as a part of the restoration on this truck that I'm probably going to end up doing, I'm probably going to end up redoing all the vacuum lines eventually. And I'm going to clean them all up. You can see I don't have very many vacuum lines because I have a stick. <laughs> That's probably part, a big part of why this thing is still on the road is because the Explorers were notorious for bad automatic transmissions, but the stick shift models just run and run and run. I know this because, as I said about pick and pull, I mean, you can hardly ever find a Sport or an XL with a 5-speed there. You almost always find XLTs, Eddies, Limiteds, any of the 4-doors, and they're all automatic, so it's usually the transmission that puts them in the junkyard. <clears throat> so, let's go pull that PCM. It was around about this time that I realized that the uh, OBD-1 codes were reading 513 for voltage fault and everything else was kind of following that. So I kind of realized that maybe it was the ECM itself. I would read several forum posts about the uh, engine control computer inside the uh, Explorer, Mustangs, other 93, 90-ish, 88 to 94, 95, 96 era Ford vehicles were having problems with faulty caps. So I decided to take a look. So I took a look at the 91 to 94 Ford Explorer service manual. This is where my ECU is apparently. It lives in this kick panel here right underneath the uh, glove box. If you look, you can even kind of see it. Um, yeah, that gray thing there, that's the corner edge of the EEC4 module. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull those two screws here and pop that out. And being a computer guy, this might not be that bad. Not even two minutes later, to remove the kick panel, you undo this screw here, this screw here, and then there's a little plastic doohickey here that snaps the uh, plastic in on the back edge of the kick panel, and here we are. Here's your Ford EEC4 computer in a 93 Ford Explorer Sport, and where you get to it. Um, we're gonna pull this out, we're gonna take a look, see if the capacitors are leaky, or if there's any other signs of damage, clean the connectors, you know, give her a nice once over. Because if it's not that, then I probably have a wiring fault somewhere. And I kind of have an idea where to start with throttle position sensor and a couple other things. And that might actually fix it up. <sighs> Once all this is buttoned up, I'm going to have to get this thing in oil change because there's gas in the oil. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Because all this rich condition BS. Okay, hey, so we got the ECU out. So you can see here, um, you have to undo this back clasp. And then for the ECU connector, this is actually really easy, and I'm surprised nobody who's talked about EEC removing a uh, engine module from a late 80s, early 90s Ford has never mentioned this. This bolt back here, you use a, uh, I think it's a 332 socket, and it just unscrews it. This is actually turning out to be pretty easy. And oh yeah, you have to use a, I think, what is this one? This is a 732 socket to undo the bolt here to get the, just this out, and that's the only part you need to get out. And there we go. This is what a 93 Ford Explorer ECU looks like. Now, if I have to replace this, this is the critical stuff. And I actually saw this on Explorer forum. Um, they said, 
there was a guy on there looking for a computer that was version any one. <laughs> Everybody thought he meant any computer. Well, apparently it's a legitimate thing. I guess this means if you have a 93 two-wheel drive sport that was built in the same batch as mine, <laughs> you have the most cryptic, bizarre freaking code on here. So I'm back on my uh, phone camera again. So what we have here is my 93 Ford Explorer ECM. And if you look closely, you can see there's some damage. This capacitor is completely gone. I mean, it is leaked fluid. Um, I see damage to the traces here. I'm probably gonna be spending the day doing some bodge wires and some capacitor replacements. So that one's bad. If we look at this one over here, um, feels a little, it felt a little crackly when I first did it, so I'm going to recap this whole board uh, with brand new electrolytics. And then this one right over here, um, you can see there's corrosion on the terminals. So, yeah, she's getting some new capacitors. <laughs> eh. See, all my hobbies kind of um, cross over each other. Um, Although technically this isn't a hobby, uh, this truck is my daily driver. So, um, I build guitar pedals, I build guitars, I work on vintage computers, but I also happen to have a vintage Ford Explorer. Yeah, I'm calling it vintage. We got the first capacitor out, 47 UF, and it, this is the, welcome to Creeping Nets Digital Basement. These weren't refas, but they might as well have been. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad cap, so I'm going to go ahead and clean this up, and then we'll take another look at it. This is what the results of this is. I'm going to do some continuity checks and put in some bodge wires if needed be. It looks to me that this is a grounding pad here, and it's just completely caked or oxidized but it looks like I might be able to scrape it off the top. So I'm gonna use some very, very careful, careful work off camera to get this just right. Cause I mean, just to get it that is just, that is just nasty. Um, and then I'm gonna use my uh, ohm meter to do some continuity checks between the contacts. And then we're gonna do bodge wires if we need any. If not, I'm gonna to try to clean up as much of this as I can, put in the new capacitor, maybe after that we'll maybe put some nail polish over it to protect it from further oxidation. Um, honestly, I'm not too worried about oxidation though because this uh, particular, uh, on the Explorers, the ECU's inside the interior, so it's not really likely it's going to get attacked by uh, liquid. Be honest, if it wasn't for this, this thing would look still pretty new because the other two caps are going to be a lot less work, I think. So now we got two capacitors out of the Explorer uh, engine computer. And yeah, the crispy critters, it turns out that 10 UF was just about as terrible as the other one. I you can see the spot. So I'm going to clean that up and then we're going to put this new guy in there. And we shall put him. And then we shall uh, move on to the last 47 UF, and then we'll slap this thing back in the Explorer, see how she runs. Soldering is all done. New caps all the way around. Let's go put her back together, stick her in the X, and see what happens. So it actually took me a couple of tries to fix the uh, PCM fully. I had to uh, put a couple bodge wires in after the initial try didn't work out. And yeah, so that's kind of how it goes, you know, sometimes. So anyway, the tests will come after that second try. Okay, so now we're going to just do the key on engine off codes since we've run it already. And we're just going to see what she does. Hmm. Not getting anything. We'll go check it out in a moment. So it looks like the gas gauge is holding. That's the weird part. Maybe it was my gas gauge all a cause of a computer problem? Okay, so I'm gonna double check my connections on the connector here. Um, 
keep her in neutral. Oh, that sounds really good. So we're gonna back her out and see how she does and take her for a spin. Running really good now. <laughs> oh, doggy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't have turn signal. Yeah, she's actually sounding better than she did before this. I've got some theories that my computer might have been gradually dying. <laughs> I've got some theories that my computer might have been gradually dying. So we're gonna give her a nice little spin around the block and see what she says. <laughs> yeah, she's got a little more power than she used to have. So that's good. I wonder how the heck she was running without the battery. It's still a little burbly, but eh, it happens. So she's sounding pretty good. She is going to need an oil change. I'm not leaving that oil in there. Not for very much longer, for sure. Wait for the white Chevrolet. <sighs> yeah. You always assume just because it's an Explorer, it's a slow automatic. Huh. Okay. So. Hey, she's holding RPM nicely. Whip her around the block just one time. And I go through here through the Target parking lot. She's sounding pretty good. Her idol's getting really good too. Taking her through. take her around target and then we're gonna take her around back and just kind of creep along what is this guy doing oh you're parking you see this is why I don't like new the newer explorers they're just too damn big <laughs> and I like my little weedy rinky dink Ford Explorer Sport that can like just weave in and out of everything when there's an emergency this thing will get out and get away temperature staying nice and low engine seems pretty happy there goes my uh, throttle thing. <laughs> yeah, creeping her at low RPM, see if she idles well. Right now she's holding probably the most steady idle I've ever seen out of this truck in years. So yeah, it was that, com that, it was that ECU computer deteriorating that was killing my Explorer. So oh, I got a check engine light on. Check engine light is on, probably emissions related, so we'll come back and check on it. That's the only thing I've got, and we'll get the OBD codes and then we'll check that out. So yeah. So we have the check engine light, and I'll probably just get that, whoa. Jesus Christ, dude, it's a traffic circle, not a car race. So yeah, I got I got a check engine light, but at least we know what's going on. 
I'm only a block away. I just take her for a spin. So the ECU is happy now at least. The rest of her is a little cranky, but we can take care of that. Best brakes in the biz. And I'm just gonna turn anyway, because this guy's going. Now we're just taking her for a quick little test spin around the block. I think after this we're going to give her an oil change and then we're going to check the rest of the emissions equipment. Probably get a KOEO or KOER test so I can, you know, check on the stuff. But otherwise she's running great. I mean, so I think it's probably the emissions equipment having a fit. Probably my O2 sensors because there's gas still in the exhaust. There's literally no knocking, no pinging under acceleration, no more accel no more hesitation. She's running pretty good. So, you know. Overall, pretty good little truck so far. Probably after this, we're gonna do some stuff. So probably after this, we'll run some codes. We'll see what she's saying. Well, I might actually. Alrighty. So yeah, she's running like she's supposed to now. I think the ECU part of the problem is fixed, but we still have a check engine light going on, so. He's got some suspension work to do soon. Okay, so we're going to put on the parking brake, and we're going to check after the test drive, check engine lights on, just idling a little lower, so we're going to go ahead and run codes one more time and take a look. Alright, first we're going to see if she starts up nicely. Yeah, so she's dropping idle somewhere in there, and there's no check engine light this go round. So I'm thinking what's going on is we, we're getting hit on the O2 sensor somewhere. So, yeah, I'm going to run codes real quick, and then we'll see what's left. Spin around the block, we're going to do COEO and COEER codes, aka key on, engine off, and then key on, engine on. We did get a check engine light while I was driving. This might just be because I have gas in the oil and it was going to be just a very, very, very brief drive, but All right, so let's see what she says now. <laughs> My wonky gas gauge. There goes the primer. Only getting one one ones. Hmm.
longer wait time between codes. Now we're gonna do key on engine on. That was a little rougher start. Idle is high. Now yeah, she's settling down. So it must be the warm-up behavior from a cold start because she is starting cold, so. Jack engine light came on, blink. So right now we're going to kind of go through the uh, codes that I saw. Um, first off we had two 111s during the key on engine off, that means no fault found. 117, the ECT below minimum voltage, I'll check that out, but probably off camera. Not sure why I'm getting a 617, I have a stick shift, it says 1-2 malfunction, there's no issue with 1-2, whatever. Um, KO your three, one, then the fast codes with key on engine running. Heated oxygen sensor, HO2S, bank one mixture lean. So yeah, I have a couple lean codes and they're coming from bank one and two. But it seems like otherwise everything is pretty much fine. Um, I do see the EGR solenoid circuit malfunction during key on engine off. I think that's probably what triggered my uh, triggered my check engine light. Now, as of the time of recording this, it's already been almost an entire week, and tomorrow's the day I do the oil change. So, um, the assessment was after today's test drive, which I didn't record, is that it pretty much is running fine. There was no check engine light, idle smooth, idles around 600, 700, wherever that number, magic number is where the needle drops, and it's running like bone stock. So, I have to say, I think we have a complete success repair here. Uh, can't wait to go throw some uh, 5W30, fresh 5W30 down her gullet, and give her heck next week. <laughs> Yeah, so, um... Yeah, it's, uh, we just drained all that gas-filled oil out. Um, next part will be to take out the air filter, the oil filter up there. I'm gonna do off-camera with my little tool here. And then we'll put a brand new 
Motorcraft F1 LA filter into the truck. While that's going on, I'll just go ahead and uh, put my glove back on and do my stuff. So, um, this go around, we went ahead and decided to heed the other codes. Um, as it turns out, um, this might be more preventative maintenance, but I decided to go ahead and replace the two uh, sensors involving the uh, coolant temperature, which is the ECT, which is located on top of the, uh, just under the throttle body, right on top of where the thermostat goes. And then also I decided to also replace the um, voltage, uh, the actual uh, sensor for the uh, thermal gauge, which escapes me right now. And it actually seemed to make quite an improvement um, and cleared up the codes, so yeah. And you can see these must have been the original parts because they don't look like they've ever been replaced. New oil, new ECT, sensors. Let's take her for a spin. Before I overheat my phone, so you can see, temperature gauge just hung around normal, and this is sitting in 95 degree heat in the southwest. She does not mind this weather at all. Voltage was staying right at 12, steady. Oil pressure perfectly in the normal. My gas gauge is mysteriously starting to kind of half work, which is kind of interesting. I thought the floats in these filled up, but maybe it's not. Um, yeah, she's got 310,209.3 miles on her. I mean, not bad for a truck of this age. So, you know, and right now I also wanted to talk about one last thing. So. One of the major discussions I've also had about why I keep this thing is also, yeah, it's a classic and I've always wanted to own a classic car. And it just so happens my first ride managed to make it from family car to first car to daily driver, now to classic daily driver. Will I ever add anything to the fleet? Maybe when I get a house. I've been thinking a 4x4 Ranger might be in order since this thing makes a great pre-runner type truck out in the desert. Anyway, this is Creeping Net, signing out.